Hey everybody, I feel like I'm kind of behind in getting these videos done for my book, A Christian Case Against Donald Trump. Um, but actually, it's turning out that the timing is pretty interesting. I'm in chapter four right now, which is all about the way of justice. And these videos are lining up with current events in kind of a remarkable way, I think. So the book is available on Amazon at the link below. Now, I've been working about 50 to 60 hours a week lately, so I'm rushing to get these videos out in my free time. So today I'm going to combine two sections from the book. And then in a couple days, I hope to have the final section done. So like I said, these are all from chapter four, which is called the way of justice versus the way of the oppressor. Now, the Bible isn't hard to understand when it comes to justice. It speaks with a clear and unified voice. The hard part is living by what we know. And when we look at the scriptures, they fly in the face of everything about Donald Trump and his mega movement. I get hundreds of people leaving comments on these videos telling me with certainty that a vote for Trump is a vote for Christianity. And honestly, it's kind of sad and pathetic, I think, to hear that over and over. Because in the light of scripture, Donald Trump's strategies are just diametrically opposed to Christianity. Now, if you boil your faith down to a couple of like hot button political issues that some politician used as bait in order to hook you like a fish, then you're not doing it right. You're being manipulated to support an abusive and a corrupt movement in the name of Jesus. And then when you post comments on a YouTube video trashing on people who are just trying to point out the obvious, I think, then you're compounding the damage by taking your own internal moral confusion and pushing it out into the ether. So today, I'm just going to do two things. First, we'll look at what the Old Testament prophets say about justice. And then we'll look at what Jesus has to say. And we'll just compare the ways of Trump with, with these biblical examples of justice. So let's just jump in here. How the Prophets Speak to Trump's America The Old Testament prophets routinely warned God's people that their blessings depended on doing justice in the land. So let's look at the book of Amos as an example of how those prophets spoke. I fell in love with Amos in seminary. My first encounter traumatized me a little bit. I was supposed to have read it before class, but homework was never much of a personal priority for me. So... When the professor asked if everyone had read it, I sort of moved my head noncommittally and busied myself with a pencil. And that move got me through about 20 years of formal education. So the professor said, okay, then let's open our Bibles to Amos and get started. Now, in truth, I hadn't encountered Amos before I sat in the classroom that evening. I had no idea where to find him in, my, in the Bible. I opened to the middle because I perceived he was a minor prophet. The professor waited patiently while the rest of the class watched me page forward all the way to the New Testament. No luck. So I returned to the middle and began paging my way backward towards Genesis. By the time I got to Leviticus, I felt a little sweaty. And the professor said, well, maybe we should get started while he looks for it. So I panicked and I put my thumb to the upper corner and just like word through the pages. But unfortunately, Amos didn't flash by. So the professor finally said, you realize the Bible has a table of contents, right? So despite my rough start, those seminary lectures on Amos deepened my understanding of biblical justice. I'd been moved in the past by Martin Luther King Jr., but I didn't know he was paraphrasing Amos when he said this, No, no, we are not satisfied, and we will not be satisfied, until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Amos doesn't allow us to blindly accept the unjust structures of our society. Throughout the book, he prophesies against the wealthy and powerful people of the northern kingdom of Israel, or Samaria, because they systematically oppress the poor. 
He begins with oracles against surrounding nations, but quickly drops the hammer on the people of Israel to teach them that God will show no favoritism when it comes to their own acts of injustice. This is what the Lord says, For three sins of Israel, even for four, I will not relent. They sell the innocent for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. They trample on the heads of the poor and on the dust, as on the dust of the ground and deny justice to the oppressed. Amos comes against the people of Israel because they oppress the poor, both economically and legally. He uses graphic, violent language to warn that God will punish them for their victimization of their own people. For instance, he invites the enemies of Israel to mobilize against them, saying, Assemble yourselves on the mountains of Samaria. See the great unrest within her and the oppression among her people. They do not know how to do right, declares the Lord, who store up in their fortresses what they have plundered and looted. Therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says. An enemy will overrun your land, pull down your strongholds, and plunder your fortresses. Everything Amos says to Israel applies to us. He mocks the citadels Israel has built high in the hills of Samaria, the strongholds where they feel safe. And he warns them that God opposes the way they've hoarded wealth for themselves at the expense of the poor. On the day I punish Israel for her sins, I will destroy the altars of Bethel. The horns of the altar will be cut off and fall to the ground. I will tear down the winter house along with the summer house. The houses adorned with ivory will be destroyed, and the mansions will be demolished, declares the Lord. I told a story earlier in the book about enjoying a beautiful boat ride with friends in northern Minnesota. Now, that vacation cost money. I haven't taken a vow of poverty. I'd like to build a little financial security for my family. I still have enough Republican in me to believe that some form of capitalism with guardrails offers the best hope for lifting people out of poverty. But we must be clear-eyed about the injustices that remain in our system. We may be tempted to object that we're different from the folks Amos railed against, that we've played by the rules to earn what little we have through our own hard work. On one level, that's true, of course, but Amos doesn't simply accept the system as it is. Just because the wealthy and powerful have written the rules to entrench their power through legal means, it doesn't mean that those rules are just. Justice goes beyond mere rule following. It demands a prophetic voice for continual reform. Listen to how Amos talks to the wealthy women of the day who enjoyed the fruits of a system that was rigged in their favor. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan on Mount Samaria, you women who oppress the poor and crush the needy, and say to your husbands, bring us some drinks. The sovereign Lord has sworn by his holiness, the time will surely come when you will be taken away with hooks, the last of you with fish hooks. You will each go straight out through breaches in the wall, and you will be cast out toward Harmon, declares the Lord. My goal here is to make one very simple point. Amos tells us that we're responsible for the system we help create. And when we vote for Donald Trump, we knowingly empower a predatory ruler who's been proven to take advantage of the poor and abuse his enemies and who attempts to escape accountability for his own criminality. In 2016, Donald Trump and his business partners agreed to pay $25 million to settle three lawsuits against Trump University for engaging in predatory practices against the people who enrolled in his real estate investment seminars. Many of those people were economically disadvantaged, and they believed Trump cared about helping them improve their lives. The National Review, hardly a liberal source, wrote an article in 2016 entitled, Yes, Trump University Was a Massive Scam. The article quotes the lawsuit itself. The free seminars were the first step in a bait and switch to induce prospective students to enroll in increasingly expensive seminars, starting with the three-day $1,495 seminar 
And ultimately, one of the respondents advanced seminars such as the Gold Leap program, costing $35,000. At the free 90-minute introductory seminars to which Trump University advertisements and solicitations invited prospective students, Trump University instructors engaged in a methodical, systematic series of representa misrepresentations designed to convince students to sign up for the Trump University three-day seminar at a cost of $1,495. During one of those class action Trump University lawsuits, Trump repeatedly attacked the judge, who was born in Indiana because of the judge's Mexican heritage. Here's Trump's response when CNN's Jake Tapper asked him what the judge's heritage had to do with the trial. And he said, no, I won't dismiss the case, and she doesn't have to be the well, plaintiff. Let me tell you, heritage? I'll tell you what it has to do. I have had ruling after ruling after ruling that's been bad rulings, okay? I've been treated very unfairly. Before him, we had another judge. If that judge was still there, this case would have been over two years ago. Let me just tell you, I have had horrible rulings. I've been treated very unfairly by this judge. Now, this judge is of Mexican heritage. I'm building a wall. Okay, I'm building a wall. I am going to do very well with the Hispanics, the Mexicans. So everybody. no Mexican judge could ever be involved in a case well, that involves you? Uh, he's a member of a society where, you know, very pro-Mexico, and that's fine. It's all fine. But Except I think, you're calling I think he should recuse himself. Because uh, he's Then Latino. you also say, does he know the lawyer on the other side? I mean, does he know the lawyer? You know, a lot of people say but yes, I'm not I don't know. That's another problem. But you're invoking his race when talking he, about whether or not he can do his job. Jack. I'm building a wall, okay? I'm building a wall. I'm trying to keep business out of Mexico. Mexico's fine. There's nothing... But he's American. Mexican... He's an American. Now, Trump hit the oppressor trifecta in this case. He scammed the poor, he attacked the justice system, and he launched a bigoted personal assault against the man responsible for overseeing the case. It's the way he's always operated. It's no secret. And conservative Christians overwhelmingly voted to make him president of the United States a few months after this interview. In the early 1970s, Trump was in the process of taking over the company his father had built. And during that time, they came under scrutiny for unfair rental practices. An article in the New York Times called no Vacancies for Blacks, How Donald Trump Got His Start and Was First Accused of Bias, says... Over the next decade, as Donald J. Trump assumed an increasingly prominent role in the business, the company's practice of turning away potential black tenants was painstakingly documented by activists and organizations that viewed equal housing as the next frontier in the civil rights struggle. The Justice Department undertook its own investigation and in 1973 sued Trump management for discriminating against blacks. Both Fred Trump, the company's chairman, and Donald Trump, its president, were named as defendants. Trump and his father fought the lawsuit, and according to the article, after nearly two years of legal wrangling, the Trumps gave up and signed a consent decree. As is customary, it did not include an admission of guilt, but it did include pages of stipulations intended to ensure the desegregation of Trump properties. Now, I'm not making any accusations about Trump's personal bigotry. That's beside the point. What matters is that, according to the lawsuit, he and his father engaged in a systematic practice of discrimination against potential black renters. If that's true, it doesn't matter whether he acted out of a personal prejudice or a belief that renting to minorities might drive down the value of his properties. That's what oppression looks like, no matter what the reason. And Donald Trump's current treatment of immigrants proves that he hasn't changed. He's more than willing to treat human beings like garbage if it helps him to grow his power and wealth. Given the support so many followers of Jesus have lavished on Trump, I can't help but think about the following passage when I drive through a church parking lot and see well-nourished Christians with freshly washed faces getting out of expensive cars with Trump stickers on their bumpers on their way to worship. Amos writes, Go to Bethel and sin. Go to Gilgal and sin yet more. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three years. Burn leavened bread as a thank offering and brag about your free will offerings. Boast about them, you Israelites, for this is what you love to do, declares the Sovereign Lord. 
I hate, I despise your religious festivals. Your assemblies are a stench to me. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps, but let justice roll on like a river and righteousness like a never-failing stream. Now, we can debate the best policies to promote economic justice and legal equality in America, but banishing Donald Trump and his oppressive influence from our politics is an essential step toward the way of justice. Does Jesus care about justice? Most of the passages I've quoted so far come from the Old Testament prophets, but Jesus placed justice at the center of his own ministry as well. In Luke 4, Jesus begins his public ministry like this. He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So Jesus talks about justice in the first recorded words of his public ministry. The passage he quotes from Isaiah promises that one day in him, everything will be made right. And how does he describe that day? Good news to the poor, recovery of sight to the blind, freedom for the oppressed. This is what the kingdom of God looks like. These things are tangible evidence of the reign of God, and they follow a consistent pattern throughout Scripture. God cares for the poor and the marginalized, and he promises to pour out his wrath on their oppressors. Jesus talks about justice in the Sermon on the Mount as well. But if you've mostly read the Bible in English, like me, you may not have noticed. The New Testament uses a Greek word, dikaiosune, that, according to Nicholas Wolterstorff, means going right or doing right. But this word can be translated as either justice or righteousness in English. According to Wolterstorff, many English versions of the Bible use the word justice when the context suggests a legal setting, but they otherwise default to righteousness. So when we read the Bible in English, it might seem as though Jesus isn't nearly as concerned with justice as the Old Testament prophets. We only see the word justice in rare passages like Luke 18.8, 8, where Jesus tells a story about a judge and says, I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. But note how the meaning in Matthew 5.6 subtly changes in English if we substitute the word justice for righteousness. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness versus blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice. It's the same Greek word, and the choice of translation in English makes a difference to how we interpret the passage. To my mind, the word righteousness implies moral purity, moral uprightness. But the word justice implies all the things I've been discussing from the Old Testament prophets, including moral purity. I find it interesting that Spanish has only one word, justicia, to translate dikaiosune. Matthew 5, 6 reads this way in Spanish, Bienaventurados los que tienen hambre y sed de justicia. I'd be surprised if native Spanish speakers didn't have a subtly different understanding of the Sermon on the Mount than English speakers do. How could they not? At least in my own experience, I've underestimated the importance of justice to the message of Jesus. When I hear the Sermon on the Mount, I tend to hear Jesus calling me to an ever higher level of moral purity, righteousness. He's certainly doing that, but that righteousness contains distinct notes of justice 
that used to be invisible to me. I feel called to something more than moral purity when I hear Jesus say, For I tell you that unless your justice surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. This helps me to better understand the passage I quoted earlier. Woe to you Pharisees, because you give God a tenth of your mint, rue, and all other kinds of garden herbs, but you neglect justice and the love of God. You should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone. So what's my point? I believe many American Christians go about our lives with an incomplete understanding of what it means to live a righteous life. We don't hear Jesus' call to do justice, to continually strive for equity and fairness for all human beings. And that misunderstanding allows us to vote for unjust rulers like Donald Trump. So let's return to the image I used earlier about the church parking lot full of expensive cars with Trump bumper stickers. Imagine I'm an elder at that church. I own one of those cars. Let's say I earn my money as an attorney for a large real estate developer. Like Donald Trump, my boss is notorious for taking advantage of small-time contractors by hiring them to do projects and then refusing to pay once the work is done. My job is to fend off legal claims that these individual plumbers and landscapers and electricians file to try to recoup their money. Let's say everything I do is legal. I simply overwhelm these economically disadvantaged workers with impossible legal challenges and delays. My goal is to exhaust their ability to press their claims until they agree to settle for 30 cents on the dollar. Let's say I've put several of them out of business along the way which demonstrates that I'm, quote, good at my job and I'm willing to go to the mat for my boss. And my car sits in the church parking lot this morning because I'm giving a talk to the men's Sunday school class called Living for Jesus in the Workplace. This is how American Christians often live our lives. Righteousness simply means keeping our pants up and following the rules. Justice means using the law to keep the others in order. And everything else is fair game, including voting for Donald Trump. I think Jesus might like a word with us. All right, so that's the end of that excerpt. If you found this video helpful, as always, please share it with somebody. And if you buy the book on Amazon, please leave a review. And thanks for listening.